Over the shores of Kent they came, over the beaches of Sussex and the flats of the Thames estuary. A hundred, a hundred and fifty, two hundred at a time, with their cargoes of bomb and fire and their fighter escorts massed around them. Where do you train air crew when Britain is already involved in the conflict? Uh, it's not a very good place to be learning to fly when you might have a fighter on your tail in any moment. They looked at uh, where would we do this and Canada, it made sense. Canada has the American technological market immediately south of us. We've got all the natural resources and wide open spaces, and we're not a combat zone. It made perfect sense to do it here. They started building this base in 1940. The hangar that we're standing in was completed over the winter of 1940-41. And this base with five hangars and all the infrastructure, barracks, H huts, the hospital, uh, everything was ready to go in May 1941. And this, this is just one of schools right across the country. Seven hundred and one of these hangars were prefabbed in BC, brought to the sites by rail and erected in that short period of time. And right now, if you travel across the country, most of the commercial airports you'd fly to were built originally as BC ATP bases. Imagine what that did to a small prairie town or anywhere. All of a sudden you've got, as this base was, 50 buildings, five of them great big hangars, and all that taking place, employing everybody for miles around, it, would, it, it changed the country. Everybody had work. Well, the first thing I would like to say, I was no hero. I was just an ordinary Joe doing what had to be done when it had to be done. I was a flying instructor. Nobody wanted to be a flying instructor. We didn't, no, nobody chose to do that, but you did what you were told to do where you were told to do it. So I, I spent most of my wartime career at different places, but a lot of it here at Brandon Number 12 Service Flying Training School, training supposedly bomber pilots. The women that were pilots and there were a few of them, were mostly ferry command pilots. And what they would do uh, is deliver aircraft, pick aircraft up from one place, deliver them to another place, deliver them from the factories or service depots to active fields. So they, they would be able to fly almost any type of aircraft and most anywhere in the country. Currently, we have five of these aircraft that are runnable, that are airworthy, that can fly. Uh, the cars and trucks you see around are, are period pieces that served in the plan. Every aircraft, whether it's an airliner or a private aircraft, needs to have an annual inspection done on it. And uh, that's what's going on with the Harvard. That's why its panels are removed. That we measure the compression make all the adjustments, look for wear, tear and damage, and basically give it a medical each year. It looks like a jumble, but actually there's a complete Yale airplane in here other than the fuselage and the wings. Uh, there's parts of a ferry battle, there's parts of Lysanders, uh, things like this engine under here that's in a pretty decent shape. Uh, there's engines from Tiger Moz, there's engines from Cessna Cranes. Uh, the problem is to know what each of the parts are and keep track of them. Well, what are archives? The archives are the raw material for telling the story. And as we keep our aircraft operational and as we try and repair other ones, 
This is the raw material. This is where it comes from. I have a lot of regrets because I wanted to fly mosquitoes very badly. That was my choice of an aircraft. Most, an awful lot of people, it was their, their choice would be Spitfires, but Spitfires were the glory aircraft. But mosquitoes were the, the fastest and most versatile aircraft we had uh, during World War II. A, a bad night in Bomber Command, if there was this is a, a, the worst nights possibly. With a thousand plane raid out, lose a 10% loss, and uh, that was 100 aircraft down, seven boys in each one of them, 700 killed in one night, night after night. And, you know, we knew it was happening, but people, civilian people, didn't know that was happening night after night. And, that was one of the things that, it was on your mind, because these were boys that you had trained. Not all of them, by any means, but those are the boys that you, you had trained to go there and whatnot. And, uh... There are 18,039 names out there of young men and women, mostly men, but some women, who were wearing the RCAF uniform when they perished, between when the war broke out in 1939 to when it ended in 45. Archie taught some of those young guys whose names are on the wall, and that's his generation out there. Uh, I'm looking for Al Quantrill, who is right up here, who was my roommate, and one of the toughest jobs I did during the war was gathering up his belongings to send home to a 20-year-old widow. And I, excuse me if I get a bit emotional, but that, that is, there are many names on here of, of friends that boys I went to school with and flew with, but that one hits me more than any of them. Just to think of, the, she was probably pregnant at the time as well. And was, he would never have seen any of his family. And a 20 year old is an awful young person to be a widow. As a father, I walk down that wall and I, I look at the names and I look at the ages when they passed, and that's the ages of my sons, and it's a really difficult thing to think of the sacrifice and yet the colossal waste at the same time. Just think, every one of those people had a family, a life, a favorite spot in the world, you know, planned to come home to a loved one, who knows? They deserve to be recognized. That's why the wall's out there. So I, I look at, at the gift of life we as Canadians have and the style of life we have, and I think it's worth preserving and it's worth understanding how we got here as a nation. And this is a big part of it to me. Without their sacrifice, none of us would be doing what we're doing today. I think as we go forward, if we can keep the place alive and viable and active. And I don't know, you may have noticed today there was a bunch of younger people walking through here. We could pique their interest somehow. And I think the, the biggest catch is to get them to realize that they can contribute. You know, it's possible. You don't have to stand back and hands in your pockets and do nothing. But uh, it's up to us who are here already, who have gone before to encourage the next generation to step up.